This is Heidi Helf, and you're listening to the Agile Uprising podcast. Hello and welcome to the latest installation of the Agile Uprising podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Ryan Lockard. Uh, with me, I have Paul Elia, and I nailed your last name this time, didn't I? Almost. You did it the second family pronunciation, Elia. I, I'm never going to get it right. I just give up good. at this. No, good. it's not good. You can t- I'm not going to improve if you don't tell me I'm wrong. <laughs> well, who do we have on the show? Well, tonight we're, uh, we're extending the Modern Agile series, and we're looking to dive into the Deliver Value Continuously principle. Um, and we are super honored tonight. We have, um, uh, we have John Willis with us. And um, John, first of all, appreciate you coming on. Big fan of what you've done. Um, yeah. Do you mind just giving uh, some of the listeners that may not uh, be into the DevOps space a little bit of an introduction of who you are? Where you come from, and um, you know, maybe a book that you've written that almost everyone should have read. Ah, that's funny. Yeah, no. Um, hey, everybody, thank you guys for inviting me on. Um, you know, the short version. I'm an old dude, right? I've been doing this uh, for a long time. I think at my age, I, I joke that I I, uh, I round down on my uh, years of experience. <laughs> um, so let's just say it's somewhere in the 30s. Um, and um, but, you know, last 10 years, I've been heavily involved in kind of cloud distributed computing, um, all sorts of cool stuff. Um, I think I had the first opportunity to work with uh, um, one of the first private clouds. It was actually Eucalyptus. And then I, I worked for Simon Wardley uh, at Canonical to do be mm. basically a cloud evangelist for they were OEMing the original. This is pre OpenStack. Um, so I was like one of the first, uh, I think Jeff Barr, myself and Simon were one of the few, there were a lot of cloud, there were probably about 15 cloud Arati, but like, I think less than five cloud evangelists running around. Uh, and so I did that for a while with Simon Wardley. If you guys don't know Simon, you should look him up. He's amazing. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, I ran into Adam Jacob, founder of chef and, I guess I looked old even back then. He wanted some <laughs> old guy on the team, and and uh, and I uh, I literally built the customer facing business for Chef. I was the ninth person in. I was really the first person who wasn't really part of the kind of crew. The crew was a lot of um, guys that work with Adam doing you know, pipe hitting puppet work actually, and uh, and then there's a funny story there. But um, and then the rest, the other half, were from Amazon. Um, which were people that had worked on EC2. In fact, Chris Brown invented, I mean, not invented, was the core yeah. um, developer and architect of uh, EC2. Um, so I did that. And then I, you know, I'll, I'll go a little fast here, but like after that, another gentleman who had a multi cloud management product that nobody's probably ever heard of called Nostradius asked me to do the same thing at his company that I did at Chef. That one, we got lucky. We sold it to Dell. Yeah. So I actually was at Dell. I was actually. Um, I got to self-title myself, so I made myself director of DevOps. Say. And then um, I left there, fooled around with the networking. I, I really thought about networking and DevOps and ran into a bunch of people that were doing you know, heavy-hitting network stuff with Open Daylight and SDN stuff, and that turned into a startup. Uh, it was called Socket Plane. We went ahead, and uh, we didn't even get three months old. We were acquired by Docker. Uh-huh. And so uh, that was the team, you know, kind of my team, although there was a couple of founders. Um, we did all the, the kind of really cool networking stuff that's kind of come out over the last two and a half years at Docker. Left about six weeks ago, um, looking to just get back into consulting services. And um, that's what I did 10 years ago. I used to do Tivoli stuff. And then um, I just, um, I'm a little uh, tired of the software business, not because it's, I, I, I like I like large scale transformation uh-huh. idea where you don't have to, you don't have to worry about what, what sales rep you have to bring with you or what SC has to come along when you bring a product, when you, you know, when you're coming from a product company, it's very hard to divorce yourself from the, the net reality of a software company. So yeah, so I'm back out on the street, you know, seeing if, if some of the things I've learned over the last seven or eight years and this thing we call DevOps makes sense. So I, I, a few things I just want to take a step back. There's so many good names and so many good tidbits you just dropped right there. Um, the one that actually strikes me the most is that you're given the opportunity to come up with a title and you don't come up with like grand lord imperior of all things DevOps and the sun. You go with director of DevOps. So I, uh, I think you missed an opportunity there, brother. 
Um, well, you know, it was kind of a tongue in cheek joke, right? So, um, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. um, and, and it was, you know, I was at Dell, right? Like, so I, you know, uh, you know, it's funny there, you know, so it's, it's always in context, you know, like, um, and I know you're not attacking me, but like, there's a thing going on Twitter today where I'm getting attacked. So, um, yeah. so I'm a little sensitive, but, um, if you don't have the context, right? Like, so I, I, I get it. But um, it was funny. I tweeted out, like I asked like people on Twitter, what should I call myself, right? And it mm. it came into a joke. And I did at the end. I think it was there was this irony from like the hardcore pipe hitting DevOps people. Who were like you should call yourself director of DevOps. That would be awesome yeah. at Dell, yeah. you know. Like uh, so, it really was. A, it was a meaningless thing in that I, you know, like I said, I was self titled, and I. I just kind of enjoyed the, and then, you know, in retrospect now, it's kind of fun to have a resume because the, yeah. the other people, you know, in the enterprise, they're like, wow, director of DevOps back in, you know, 2012 and 13. That's pretty interesting, you know, so yeah. anyway. So. Yeah, no, it, Twitter's a great medium. I think the last, the, literally the last podcast that Paul and I recorded together, I, uh, I said some, some things that uh, could have been seen as controversial, and I, I literally invited all of Twitter to throw their hate at me. So, you know, embrace the hate. Don't run from it, right? Yep. Um, all right, so you said a word, and uh, you, you're actually in uh, you're in familiar company because Paul and I both work in the DevOps space. Paul for a very large bank, me for a very uh, lar- uh, consultancy, a very large global consultancy that works only in the heavily regulated space, right? So, um. One of my favorite qualifiers when I talk to somebody, either a um, a partner, a potential partner, a client, or a um, an interview candidate, is this word DevOps, right? It's like the Princess Bride meme that we always see. You keep saying this word, but I don't think you know what it means. Right. <laughs> you ask 10 guys on the street what DevOps means, you get 13 answers. So right. when you talk about DevOps, John, let's just level set and come up with language that we can share here. What does that mean when you say it in your head? Oh, yeah. No, it, what it means to me um, is um, really all about culture. In fact, I, uh, I just did a presentation and keynote at uh, Serverless Conf in New York. And, uh, and, the, and it was interesting because the question that I was asked is to, can you talk about serverless and DevOps? And the organizer um, had asked me to do something along those lines. I was the keynote speaker, right? And, and all going into it, and even in the first day of the conference, I was day two keynote speaker, uh, people come up to you, so John, what are your thoughts about DevOps and service? Hmm. With, with this like kind of underpinning that they're like the catch or the, the trick question is that isn't there no ops in serverless, you know, mm-hmm. like, and, and so, um, so this went on and, and, but I had already thought through like, what am I going to say about DevOps and serverless? And I, I did some research. I've done a little bit of work with serverless, but I didn't really have a good story to tell, right? Because it's so nascent serverless, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I realized I was actually asking myself or challenging myself to the wrong questions, right? And, and I, 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 and that was the, the second slide in the presentation was um, it's, it's got a little mouse with a little head motorcycle helmet navigating its way to the cheese in the uh, mousetrap, right? Mm-hmm. And it's not about the technology, stupid, yeah. um, right? And so um, I reminded myself of a presentation that I did about two years ago uh, called Turning Human Capital into High Performance Organizational Capital. And um, – and so at some point, and I'm going to give you a little more long-winded answer, is about two years ago, I, uh, I met this guy who actually wrote the, additional, the original um, Industrial Internet white paper for GE. And he'd gone on to work for a think tank for an ex-IBM CEO, high-level person, right? Mm-hmm. And um, we agreed – I met him on a plane ride and we agreed to le- meet for lunch and I, I met him for lunch and I wanted to tell him about DevOps and why – you know, like, like how this is so important. And and I came in with like 15 slides and I got to the second slide. He gave me the tea time and he said, John, he says, I've had to go um, give presentations to Jeff Imlet, the CEO hmm. of – and he said, like, you don't get – like – like even at my level, he was like one under Beth Comstock. Comstock, Comstock is the famous CMO at GE, right? Mm-hmm. Um, who brought Eric Ries in, like great stories there. But um, he said, like even at my level, I get five minutes. He says you got to be able to, you know, like what? And I realized I came out, and he wasn't being a jerk. He just made me think, oh my god, I'm an imposter, 
Mm-hmm. I go all around the world telling people about DevOps. And if somebody asks me to go into to Jamie Diamond, or, you know, the, the CEO, yeah, yeah. JP Morgan, you know, guys know, just maybe for your cut. Oh, yeah, yeah. Just may not know. Um, or Jeff Inlet or whoever. And they said, John, right now, we're going to put you on a Learjet. Come in. We've got to tell this guy. you got five minutes, right? And um, in fact, ironic story, um, the um, – the CEO of Etsy, no longer the CEO of Etsy, um, he was asked to come in and speak to Obama for about three minutes, along with a lot of the people who talk about healthcare.gov, right? right. And he, he asked all his buddies, what do I say? I don't know what to say. And they said, just say, tell him that he needs to tell people to deploy more often, right? right. But so, but my answer was, okay, I had to solve this question, this thing to myself. And I basically came up with this idea that, um, that DevOps is about the patterns and practices that help organizations turn human capital into high performance organizational capital, hmm. right? And and so at the end of the day, that's what it is. It it's about um, we can call it culture. We can say that there are tools that get involved, but it's about humans who can collaborate, who can come up with great ideas. Humans that think about think they're sci- think like scientists who basically try to solve problems through collaboration and whether they use open source or proprietary doesn't matter it's a human condition it, you know and then like again um, I'm sure we have a lot more to talk about here definitely in an agile podcast but what we learned um, also is almost everything we talk about in DevOps um, has almost a direct correlation to things that were involved in lean and come from Toyota 100 percent Hey, hey, let me throw two things out real quick. Yeah, I mean, this is the Agile Uprising, but come on, DevOps is us too, especially me and Ryan. And uh, Modern Agile opens this up to everything, but John, your expertise, we're, you know, we're all about the technology right now, so keep going. This is awesome. Um, the other thing I wanted to throw in there is the first time you and I met, um, you said DevSecOps, and I told you how much I hated that term. Yeah, and and we proceeded to debate a little bit, and I think the people in the room were like, "Do you know who you're talking to?" And I'm like, "Yeah, I do, but I'm I'm a human being, and I don't like that term." <laughs> mm-hmm. And and then you said, "I didn't like it at first either." Oh. Yeah, I've got so a. His- can you tell our listeners why you're on board? And by the way, I'm now on board too, but I have a follow up question. Okay, once yeah. you say that. No, I'm I'm so glad you asked me this question too because this is you know I, I you know I am gonna pledge that I'm a hypocrite right now. All right, yeah. so so let's go back in time. Right, everybody has been trying to change the word DevOps. Gartner has tried to do everything yeah. in their possibility to come up with another name so they could sell to their enterprise customers that they're smarter than all these kids that don't know what they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. Um, every, um, you know, if, um, Netflix tried to pull out the no ops thing way back when, right? And it's like there's been an, an assault on this thing called DevOps. And the thing is, there has never been a body, a standard, a group that sat down and said, let's do DevOps and here's how we're going to codify it. And that's why the attack vector never surfaced, right? Because there was like the Gartners and all these companies couldn't, um, couldn't find how where you know where the where the thing was hidden right and um so i i just would defend along with others anytime there was this kind of barrier attack right and then at one point i realized all right stop this nonsense dev and ops is a metaphor right right and um so we place it because people will be like dev sec mar you know op biz dev dev you know no exactly. no it's, it's got to be where dev does it ops. stop Right. And and so I would say, you know, people, people, let's calm down here. Don't think of dev of dev and don't think of ops ops. Thinking about two sets mm. of groups that can't collaborate and there's a wall in front of them. And all we're trying to do is but we're trying to get you know faster lead time, better resilience and better organizational collaboration. Right. That's it. Mm. And um, and I lived with that and I fought it down. And then um, the gentleman who. Um, the, um, the uh, you know, Josh Corman originally, but some of my good friends out of Austin, James Wicked and Ernest, and I'm sure there's many others, but those are the ones, they, they, they did something really like beautiful. They didn't, they, when they first started, they call it rugged. They called it rugged DevOps. Right. right. And I thought, my God, that like, that was so awesome. Like you got the memo and I was all on board, but here's the thing. I'm sitting there at RSA. I spoke at RSA um, earlier this year. And a guy from Aetna comes up and he shows huh. this um, full, um, like, and he calls it DevSecOps, unapologetically. 
right? But he gives this beautiful presentation where um, what he does is he shows the value stream, our, the classic continuous deployment, you know, the boxes that we all know, right? Mm -hmm. um, filled in at every spot with an answer for, from security. Hmm. And it was the first time I, see, I saw a holistic or a systems end-to-end -end approach about security. Because, again, I, um, I said this today in my podcast. I'm not trying to criticize Rugged and my – the way I may be interpreting the history here may be is skewed. Hey, I'm 59. I can do this. <laughs> Call me an old man. But like what Rugged was awesome, but to me it always seemed to appear as if you had this license – to shim in security wherever you wanted, uh -huh. right? It was like, you. oh, you must do vulnerability scanning. Hey, you could do behavior-driven, you know, James Wickett has Gauntlet, right? And there's other, uh -huh. you know, a cucumber-based security thing where it can ask questions about port mapping and, and um, you know, and look for vulnerabilities, right? But like most people didn't treat security the way they tr treated the delivery of software. So for example, if I if you went into the shop, right? You guys do a lot of this cool stuff, right? And if you went to a shop and and they and you went in there and they had um, they were using like Selenium for behavior driven test. Uh -huh. They had some really cool Ansible stuff, but they told you, hey, by the way, um, we don't think that uh, Jenkins CI stuff is worth the time. Um, but we do a little bit of test driven development, but we don't put any of our source code in um, Git or GitHub. You'd be like, okay. what the hell, right? Or you'd like be mind boggled, like how did you get to that conclusion? But that's exactly the way security looked to me prior to 2017 or prior to RSA, right? It, it looked like we, like the acceptance of, yes, of course you would do, but nobody was saying like every box needs to be filled. It was how do you shift left if every mm -hmm. box isn't filled? And then the next presentation right after that is, is from eBay, and they're showing the same thing. All right, mm -hmm. so and I've told you this, Paul, right? This is stuck in the back of my head. Like, ooh, I, I like the taste. I love the smell of this, right? A holistic, a word that seems to imply that you're doing it wrong unless you're taking, you're filling in the, at every box. And uh, I hope the listeners know what I mean by every box. Like, I means that I have, uh, I, at, at my IDE, I have a plugin for security. At, in my source control, I do some type of scanning or static code analysis. At uh, build time, I do additional static code analysis. I do vulnerability scanning, right? I do uh, DAST or, di or pen testing in, in the smoke, right? Like, I mean, yeah. every box is filled with a security protector. And I'm like, okay, this is sticking in the back of my head. And then I'm going and... Um, you know, I'm going to call out a friend, but it, it's cool. I don't think he'd get mad at me. Jason Cox over at Disney, uh, they invited me to do Jedi training. How cool is that, right? I came in and, badass. and they just, yeah, badass. Oh. They, gave, they gave me a, a cap and everything. Are we going to have to pay George Lucas royalties for you just saying oh, that? Oh, don't even get me started. I'll tell John tomorrow what you're talking about. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, my apologies, but I, no, he, no, no, no. That's my fine. sore spot. I'll tell you tomorrow. Keep going. Yeah, I'm, right. I'm just burning him for the sport of it. They're gonna have to track down a lot of other presentations I've done, right? Because I brag about. I like bragging about that one. Anyway, so um, so anyway, did that, and then we went to lunch, and I said, just said it, and so Jason Cox has been a a, a speaker at almost every DevOps Enterprise Summit. In fact, we make him go last on whatever day because nobody wants to speak after him. Right. Like you don't want to be the guy, you know, because he brings in all these Disney like, uh, you know, videos that like, and we can never record them. Right. But like, um, like he's an amazing speaker, amazing story and his presentations, it's not fair. He gets to show you videos of, you know, things, you know, and, and so we, we have him go last because it would be unfair for anybody to speak after him. Right. right. And, and so I tell him, I said, Jason, I said, um, what do you think about this new DevSecOps thing? And his eyes lit up. I mean, lit up. I saw like, and no, tell me more. And I, and then I, as I, tr in my travels, I would like just throw out this little bone of DevSecOps. And at the executive level, a couple of things happened. One, they knew, they basically pretty much knew exactly what I was talking about with that one word, mm -hmm. which is something rugged could never do. Right, right. And two, it was easier for me to explain how it is this holistic or systems approach with a shift left. And at that point, I was like, you know what? Um, screw my integrity. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know? and, and it's, it's kind of like, you remember the old E.F. Hutton commercials? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As soon as you say it, it's like people are listening. 
Yeah, you know, I, it, it is. It, it, it like, and so I've got you know, there's a couple of friends that have still like calling me out, like I can't believe you're doing it. I and, know, but but you know what? Hey, um, well, here's well, the thing. But here, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna say two, two things, and I want to hear your comment. The two things. One is, uh, one, I've got to make a living, right? You know, but, sure. But, but, but yeah. more importantly, but more importantly, more importantly, and honestly, really, more importantly, um, because I've made i made a fair amount. Yeah, of money, John, right? I'm, you're gonna make a living no matter what. That's so right, really, right. come on. Yeah. Right, yeah, but but uh, but again, I don't want to sound like one of these guys that like you know it isn't about making money because I do make money, right? I don't sure. want to, but but at the end of the day, you know, and anybody who hears me speak or talk, they know I get passionate about things, right? Like people might not think I'm the smartest guy in the world, but they pretty much put me up there pretty high on passion. Mm-hmm. And 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 I I you know, I you know I look at Equifax. I got a friend that works over there, and oh, it breaks my, my heart, right? That he might be in trouble, and I don't think he is, right? But, mm-hmm. but, um, and then you know, I you know, I have a, a brother-in-law that's in the, um, that that's basically he was a, a, a an A ten fighter pilot, um, and um, and he, he base commander did both Iraqi wars. I mean, he's just furious that he, everything about him was out in the wild two and a half years from OP, uh, OPM. Yeah, yeah. Yep, the reach yep. over there, right? Um, and so like this has got to be fixed. Right. And so if DevSecOps is my evangelism hat is something that gets people's attention, which I don't think I know rugged doesn't, then like screw it. I'm more interested in getting people to think differently about how we deliver software when it comes to security. No, no it's, I'm, I'm with you, brother. But here's the here's the, the question I have and I still have it. But I, I, I am on the other side of the seesaw on this one now. What happens when we finally say SEC has been brought, security has been brought into the tent? So so they're in there with us. We got the developers, we got the testers, we got the ops guys, we got the security guys. I started, a, the tent. I started a, a Donnybrook on a podcast. Let's go. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Who's no, next? So- who's next? Is it risk? I mean, and then when, the, when we get them in the tent, who's next? That's the thing that always nagged me about it. And can we come up with a word – as powerful to represent what the hell we're trying to say, which is get everybody in the tent that needs to be in the tent to deliver value continuously. Yeah. So let me interrupt real quick. And I actually want to take a step out of the rabbit hole that I see us in right now. It's why do we have to say DevSecOps? Not not should we or, or what does it mean? Why do we have to say that? And and why do we have to say like Dev Risk Ops? And if that actually becomes a thing, I swear to God, I'm getting. I'm I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But here's here's my question. Like, the reason we say it is because we've made it such a, uh, not going to say that word, such a damn problem, right? Like, in the in the Death March to push code to production as quickly as possible, we've been non. On, we haven't been honest. We haven't been following the, uh, the the principles and the practices that we know are right to build safe, uh, security into the, the actual the engineering that we do. So now we have to actually call it out to do it. Right. What, is, what does that tell us? Right. Like uh, to me, the question isn't is DevSecOps a thing? Is it not a thing? Should we call it that? Should we not? Why do we even have to? Why do we have to? Why do we have to talk about these things? Why isn't it just part of the culture of the the way we build software? And I think that kind of gets back to the delivering value continuously because we're trying to push code to production much quicker. I mean, um, John, it, going back, like let's just say, so DevSecOps kind of came into my purview probably in the last less than five years, but I'll say five years. Did you ever talk about um, security as something that was expressed uh, verbally as, as something that we had to start doing before five years ago, or was it just part of the way that you built quality software? No, I mean, let's be let's be honest, right? I mean, let's go back seven years ago, and you know, the agile movement wasn't even talking about operations, right? And so, you know, this is you know. A, like we're really bad, you know. I mean, you know, we we don't learn from our mistakes because the truth is, and um, the agile movement, you know, came on like a, you know, like really good. Everybody started going really fast, but the, no, operations was not invited to the party, and so you had this waterfall True. of you know queuing, mm-hmm. and then we did the same thing kind of with QA and testing, and then you know here we are with security. So we haven't really learned. But, you know, you could look at it one way. It's, you know, it's one hill at a time. To, you know, you, you take one, you know, right. hill. Yeah. But, um, 
And and um, but you know, I mean, I mean, you know, honestly, in defense of the rugged thing is Josh and those guys in uh, like 2010 were pointing out how broken it was. Um, Chris Hoff over at um, you know, now over at Bank of America has been screaming and hollering that security is like so outdated. You know, far beyond just the, the supply chain problem, right? Yeah. Um, so uh, again, I, I don't know that um that we can look at any one group and say, well, you guys should have like known better. Right. But no, that's yeah, cool. no. yeah. <clears throat> but, um, but your point, you know, I mean, at the end of the day, we moved really fast getting this supply software supply chain and, and, um, and, and, uh, you know, I, I think I know what you're saying is that no, um, you know, and unfortunately even networking, like the whole reason I had a, a successful exit, um, three years ago was because, I stuck my nose in why is why are people building switch configurations from spreadsheets hmm. like like because that was basically four or five years ago. I mean, I started the DevOps network, DevOps for networking movement. I mean, I started it. I go back and look at the history. Um, I mean, I ran the first conference about it and, I, you know, I was talking to people and asking them, why are you guys not keeping um, your switch configurations in um, in GitHub? Why aren't you using templating for your switch configuration? I mean, Chef and Puppet started adding primitives, but that was just, you know, not enough, right? Like, why don't um, why why don't you have somebody do a commit and a pull request and then have um, have you know a peer review mm -hmm. on a switch configuration? You know, um, why weren't you using you know uh, Arista started coming out with. Um, you know, Arista was the first real um, kind of software-based. You you can log into um, to um, a, a, a Linux-like um, um, what what's the um, uh, why am I going blank right now? But the uh, the distribution that they use, the Red Hat distribution. Um, you know, and but anyway, the the point is that um, I, I think it's just we just got to keep chipping away, and even the networking stuff is still having trouble. Integrating, you know, I mean, security is actually moving faster than the network people, even though there was a movement like four years ago to try to get network people to think like developers or developers mm -hmm. to make think. Um, but but like I think security now, I mean, again, yeah, long winded answers is always. Yeah, no, it's um, it's always great. There's a couple of things that um, that that really um, I love about that. I'll, just, uh, I'll name three um, that I love. One is the hallway a track is like incredible, right? Like incredible because you have um, companies that are that have just been trying to solve the hardest problems with it, what I say is the right way, right? With the culture and speed and resilience, right? All the, 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 the primary principles of DevOps. And then, um, so that, that, that just makes like, and even like even better, I'll add a fourth, the speaker room is off the chart, but, but that's, uh, that's cheating, right? Um, you get to hang out with guys like Mike Nargard and stuff in the speaker. Room. Yeah. You know, and another thing that's really cool are the, um, the tracks themselves, right? And the reason it's cool, um, is that um, I like I said I, like I said already I'm on the selection committee so um, so each year we debate we whether we should do repeat um, speakers and it, it's a trade off because like we worry that like will people think it's stale but I love it because you you get to see Jason Cox every year and you see the progression because we all would know this right that DevOps is a journey and um, and one of my favorite is uh, Scott Pruitt at CSG. So if you get any cable bills or anything like that on paper, CSG probably printed them. And you can go back to 2014, 2015, 2016, um, and you watch their miraculous progression. Um, so I love, you know, again, you get to see news stories from people that are doing crazy stuff, but then you get to see repeat speakers where um, if you want to do your homework, you can go watch – 
their um, presentations from the last three years. And then once you, if you like, if you go see Scott Pruitt CSG, definitely watches fourteen, fifteen, and sixteen. And like when you see this year's, you'd be like, oh my god, this is awesome! Right. I got to see, I got to see like uh, you know something you don't get to see at any other conference, I don't think. And then um, yeah, and then the fourth piece, the really really juicy bit is um, we'll probably be doing um, some like special thing. Well, Sidney Decker speaking, so he's doing the day two closing keynote, and. Um, and uh, we're going to kind of invite a couple other people like Richie Cook, Sidney Decker, some of the lean people. And we're going to try to get um, them in a, in a kind of uh, closed door conversation about the similarities between lean and uh, safety oh, or resilience. Man. Yeah. So, yeah. So I'm putting yeah. my wife back on a plane on the 13th. She needs to go home on the 13th. We're going to go out there early, enjoy a little one on one time. It's time for her to go home when the conference starts. So if anything yeah, crazy yeah. happens afterwards, I, I'm in. <laughs> That's awesome. So, let me step in. I know you, you guys are talking about a conference that I'm not able to attend because I'm booked to speak at a different conference. Oh. So, yeah, bump, bump, bump. Um, so being that we're talking about the continue uh, the Deliver Value Continuously show here, one thing that we, we neglected to do because we got all excited to talk to John was actually – list out what the what the principal says on modern agile and the only reason i'm doing that is because i have a tag on question here um so on the modern agile.org site it says anything that isn't delivered isn't helping anyone be, uh, become more awesome or safe in modern agile we ask ourselves how could valuable work be delivered faster delivering value continuously requires us to divide large amounts of value into smaller pieces uh, that may be delivered safely now rather than later um so where that leads me is we say the word continuously in the title and faster in the description so it seems that we we're intentional in the way that we're saying faster but we don't actually define that in quantitative terms what does faster mean to you john like yeah 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 no it's it's just a great question um i'm already loving this podcast um the um you know, there's two ways to answer that. So um, I'll do the plug of the DevOps handbook. So we tackle this um, one part, one of the ways to answer this question, um, uh, the way we define lead time. Yep. And what we define lead time really is we discuss a little about lead time. And if you look at like the different um, people in lean or agile, you can find variants of what lead time means, right? Um and um, so we, we specifically said we think there's a thing called deployment lead time. And, and then we broke that down. And in, in, in um, deployment lead time is what we know that we can measure reasonably accurate, right? Which is when a story gets created mm -hmm. and when it hits, um, it hits, you know, and there's really two levels. But we say when it hits, um, it hits the, the, you know, the actual, um, the system. You know, whether that's um, delivery or deployment, it really doesn't matter because, um, you know, because the um, the tools that we use or the um, the strategies that we use for, for deployment, right, vary, right? We might do incremental or blue-green or whatever, right? So yep. so in, in short, it is basically kind of story to deployment. And then um, – because now we have the tools to track that, right? We have, the, you know, where our stories are created, um, what happens at commit time, what happens at build time, when it gets to, you know, what it goes to from a testing perspective, and then how it flows all the way to the system. So that's one mechanism that we can use reasonably effective to check how fast we're getting, right? Mm -hmm. And then, of course, small batches are part of that. We, you know, and then, you know, if you look at the DevOps study, um, the um, you know we found that the data shows that there are certain behavior patterns. The the Puppet Labs IT revolution um, starting in 2015, we got to see um, really good statistical, I say academically rigorous data that showed that if you had generative culture, that means you, you were blameless, you embraced failure, um, that um, you were basically um, faster and more resilient. And part of the principles were things like small batch, of course. Right. So we track that and we do that. I've always wondered about, um, you know, I'm not really an agile guy by trade. So um, and even a developer by trade, I've really been just an ops person most of my life. 
like the whole um, how do we do accurate you know, ideation? Mm. You know, how do, what is that whole left hand side? And and from uh, um, you know of really tracking metrics and putting it all together, I think that area is still gray. I know there's 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 different strategies. Um, uh, uh, Dominica Diagrandis has an amazing book coming out, and we call her kind of the goddess of. Uh, yep. Or I call it the goddess of Kanban, but um, maybe that's not the way. Oh, way Colleen! To say it. Oh, Colleen! I feel sad. Kanban, so, according yeah. to David uh, David Anderson. Yeah, yeah, and she worked for David J. Anderson yep. for a while, and you know, and she, but but yeah, and she's picked up, and and David J. Anderson definitely his some of his books have great data on cumulative flow and yep. like how you can really do um, good data analysis of the flow, but. Um, but I guess I'm just weak in my mind of how good a job we do for my ideation. So long answer is that um, I think um, we, from what I've seen in my travels, people are getting pretty good on um, you know deployment lead time and tracking that in terms of how fast you are. You know, in in the DevOps survey, we um, there's four primary metrics that have been tracked over the last um, seven years. Uh, but in 2015, it really started to rise above, if you will, is um, change success rate, um, uh, basically an, an MTTR. And then on the speed side, that's the resilient side. On the speed time, it's the number of deploys uh, per day. And then um, the, um, the what you call lead time, which, again, is from our opinion or um, deployment lead time. So and for lead time, the, the stop of the stopwatch is production, customer facing. Production. Well. Yeah, but but again, the two um, from the you know because that gets really great right. too because you don't put it all out you got, to the entire universe all at once. Sorry, man. Right. If, if you're doing canarying, right. if you're doing feature flags, right? Yeah, um, all that. So again, that um, that that there's not really a lot of good um, tooling that I see that tells you. Uh, so it's really when it hits the the kind of uh, production, but the the, the, production. the deployable. The deployable artifact, if you will. Yeah, yeah, cool. All right. So, uh, buddy of mine, shout out to Kyle Griffin, uh, local guy in Atlanta. Um, he and I have uh, good conversations about this stuff. And one of the things that he has coined as a phrase that I like is, now I'm going to butcher it, but smallest correct change to production. Mm. And what this is and what the practice is, is – Let's take whatever software solution that you've got. And, and I'm a dev guy who learned ops, by the way, just so you know where I'm coming from. I, I have a business partner that's an ops guy that became a developer. We, we cross-trained each other. It's crazy. So the small correct change to production is a practice where you take your code base, last one that, that, that you say was, was production, and you change something stupid simple about it. It could be a misspelled word on a page. It could be an HTML comment. Doesn't matter what it is. And almost like a fire drill, you want to be able to come up to that team and go, make one. Make one of those. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I want to see that get out. I want to know. I want to, I want to map that get out the door. So that... Yeah. I'm really clear on what it is I'm, I'm to optimize. And it has nothing to do with all of the goo that goes into a typical bundle of value that you would normally deliver. Well, that's, I mean, Mary Poppendix, right? Which are famous, like, how long does it take you to get one line of code right. through the system? Mm -hmm. Right? Like, uh, you know, I love, like, when I'll, I'll bring that up, I think that everybody on the planet has heard it. And then I'll be talking to some enterprise and say it, and they're like, ooh, can you repeat that? And I'm like, oh, my goodness. Um, I, I need to make sure I add that more often, right? But I want to, like, um, so I've been doing a DevOps Cafe pad ca podcast for, like, forever with Damon Edwards. And, and um, we did, really early on, um, we ran into, um, the company was originally called Kaching. And they got renamed to Wellfront. And anybody who's read Eric Reese's Lean Startup yep. will be familiar with that. So Eric Reese was um, a, a board advisor to uh, this company. And this is before he even wrote his book. He was actually just finishing up with his – he was the CTO of um, – I forget the name of the, the company. But he did a, a blog called Lessons Learned. And um, – and he basically was promoting, um, you know, continuous deployment. In fact, he had an article in the Web Operations book by John Alspar mm -hmm. on continuous deployment. That's in 2009. 
and he was an advisor for these guys. And so we walk in and they, they asked if we wanted to come visit. We did a video and we had him on a podcast first and then we had him a video and they're fascinating. So this is like 2008 to probably 2009. And, um, and they had the whole pipeline, like, like freaking built out, like there was no tomorrow. Right. And, and it was, uh, it was amazing to see, um, that way even back then they had that kind of whole delivery thing uh, spot on. Um, yeah, so one of the things that was really cool about there is um, when we were talking to them, they were kind of laughing how, you know, like a lot of companies starting 11, 12, 13 would brag that our developers um, push code to production on their first day of work, mm-hmm. right? Like the badge of honor and, you know, um, Facebook had a really good one. and But these guys were like in 2009, like, no, no, what we do is when you interview for a job, yep. we make you go for the storyboard, pull it and like, sh- you know, I don't want to, I don't care about your resume. Take that yeah. story and put it in, right? Imagine how bulletproof oh you have to be yeah. and confident that you let a, a, a person that you're interviewing pull something in your storyboard and put it in production, right? And that whole mantra of... Um, of like, I remember one time at Fa- there was a Velocity conference, and it was uh, probably 2011 ish. And Facebook, and I always love Facebook because now Google like announces all this stuff. But for the longest time, you couldn't get word one out of Google of how they did infrastructure, right? Mm. But Facebook showed up basically in 2009, 2008, telling you everything they did, right? And it was like awesome, right? And in some ways, they might have forced Google to behave the way they do now. But anyway, this great presentation, and then they're making that same comment like. Day one, our, our, our developers put, you know, you come into Facebook, you're going to push the production. And during the Q&A section, somebody asks, like, now you got to remember, there's a lot of people still thinking, like, uh, you know, um, I mean, deploy, like, um, I'll just do a little segue here. Um, when John Ospar and um, gave his presentation, 10 Deploys Day at Flickr, I, I used to joke, I was there at that presentation, and people were thrown up in the back of the room, right? Like, so we're, like, not too long after that, right? And, uh, like, you can't do that. You just can't. 10 deploys a day to production. That's horrible, right? And uh, so Facebook gives like a presentation the year, the next year later about this. And somebody in the audience says, well, I got a question. What happens if they break the system? Right. And then the Facebook guy's like, that would be right. awesome. Yeah. They'd get a promotion. Yeah. Yeah. They would like, if they're smart enough to break our system on the first day, like we we, the, we usually think they can't, you know, we wait for the first week for them to break the system. Like, you know, and like that just changed the whole mindset, right? So that then when you start thinking about that, that's the, you know, because here's the, the gem, the hidden, the like, how fast does you get to get one line of code to the system? That's not really a question. I love Mary Poppins yeah. with all my heart. Mm. The real question is, how freaking resilient are you yes. once you get that line? And how do you get that? You build the gates and you shift left and you find something here. You move it left. You know, we call it the second way of DevOps, yep. right? Uh, you know, amplified feedback, feedback yep. loop. And over time, you know, the, so um, in my uh, presentation today, I talked about like four years ago, Google talked about doing 75 million tests a day. Yep. Last year, they said it's 150 million automated tests a day. You know, like there's a reason why you don't have to call Google for support, right? That's like, right. Imagine 150 million tests, automated tests a day. Like that's, you know, that's how you get speed yeah. and there's resilience. No, so, there's no oops in that. So right, I'm going right. to yes and what you just said about resiliency and about the, 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 the volume of testing. The reason you do that is, is to, in my opinion, is to amplify learning. Right. The reason those tests exist, the reason that you guys are that we have all of these systems that um, automate the delivery and make those, you know, multiple deliveries per minute a reality is because we're building feedback loops into the system so that we can learn how the users are interacting with the system. We can learn how the software is interacting with the system and we can learn where we need to make improvements in the pipelines and in the deployment process. Right. Totally. It, it is. It is about, um, you know, I mean, if we go back to Toyota, that was a learning organization. Um, in fact, Steven Spears in his famous HBR, Harvard Business Review article, it was, uh, um, it was some morph of the title, Decoding the Toyota Parks and System DNA. And in there, he said that in Toyota was a community of scientists continually experimenting, right? And if you read Mike Rother's Toyota Kata, like, he'll talk about the four-step Kata. 
but and also in Rother's book, he talks about something that's really awesome that ties to exactly what you said, which is that um, there was two incidents about Toyota that I think are just brilliant stories. One was, um, and this is right out of Rother's book, this first one, where um, there was a plant in Toyota City that would average a thousand andon pulls a day, uh, shift. And for those who don't know, Toyota had this thing where there was a rope, and anybody on the manufacturing line of a car could pull the rope. And they had a time window, but ultimately could stop the line. And um, and so, um, and in fact, I like to add from a culture perspective, what Rother said is when you pull that, the first thing that happened was the floor manager came over and thanked you. And they thanked you before they even knew why right. you pulled it. And, and here's the thing. when they, In that Toyota plant, it was doing a thousand and on pulls um, a shift. They went down to 800 at one point. And now, um, kind of Western culture, Sloan, uh, Tayloristic, you know, your GM, right? Like you guys are laughing. I'm not sure everybody knows that, but we don't have to get into that right now. But like, they'd be like, yes, 200 less right. defects a shift. And, but the plant manager gets everybody in in all hands and says, we got a, we used to, we got a problem, right? Lee didn't say Houston, but, um, and he said, you know, and, and like the thing was that we're learning 200 times less a shift. And I'll tell you one more uh, anecdotal story, which I think is brilliant. There was a Kentucky plant, a Toyota Kentucky plant that produced, you know, 2,200 cars a day. And there was some um, analyst or industry analyst, automotive analyst, who was interviewing uh, the, you know, the plant manager or the GM, whoever was in charge, and said, oh my God, how do you guys, and, and I'm literally licensed here, but the numbers are absolutely fact true. Uh, how do you guys produce 2,200 cars a day? And they said, oh, it's quite easy we pull the and on cord 5,000 times a day, mm -hmm. right? And um, so, yes, I mean, it, like that's the, um, that's the generative culture. We embrace family, fa failure. We want failure. I mean, the chaos engineering yeah. is all about like breaking things purposefully so that we get better. And it's a hard oh, pill to oh, swallow yeah. for, leg for legacy oh, enterprise oh, people. Yeah. No, no, no. And, and I had a PowerPoint deck chaos engineered today. I acknowledged the person that outranked me that did it. And said thank you because I have to give this to the C suite next week. <laughs> you keep chaos in yeah, yeah. my PowerPoint deck. It, it works everywhere. I I, I want to throw something into the room that, um, you know, we we have a myth I think in deliver value continuously conversation that you you often hear users aren't ready. They can't handle the kind of stuff you're talking about. That's Google. That's Facebook. It, it, no, oh. it's not. Um, it's not. You you got to think about it like how do you get value to the customer so that a they can get a little bit of value and b you could learn something. But that doesn't mean you have to force on them. Like if you got some big system and you're typically doing three releases a year, at, and you think it just doesn't apply to me, it does apply to you. It just doesn't mean you pound your customer over the head a thousand times a day, but you could make a thousand of your incremental bits of value available for them to take if they wanted it. Um, yeah, I know you're, it is, that's a John question, but I just want to jump in here because I've uh, in the past and with some clients that I work with now, you run into that, right? Like the whole idea of release. If, if you say release and people tense, that means they're thinking of those those very large monolithic application driven releases, right. where a feature is basically three to six months of, of programming that you're about to drop into the into production. Cross your fingers, your toes, your eyes, and everything, and hope for the best. We're like, all gonna lose sleep for the next three weeks. Yeah. For me, if I have anybody either in technology or in the business that is apprehensive about the impact to the customer or the change, it's like. Dummy, your change is too big, right? Like, think about ways that we can we can validate. Like, it's all about mitigation. You can mitigate by probably a number of ways, but the two that jump into my head is make it smaller, so that if you you aim small, you miss small. And secondly, build some tolerance into your workflow, so that you know with high probability that you're you're not going to release something that that introduces the chaos monkey. To go back to that, and also, you know. That's that's really when you need to look at things like the canary deploy, where you're not introduced. You're not say you put in something there that, that is horrendous. You don't want to break it for everybody. Find ways that you're you're introducing this and you're getting some behavior feedback right. loops into your into well, your into your system. Yeah, no, you know, I mean, the thing is, um, I had um, 
Adrian Krakow on our podcast a while back, me and Damon, and and you know we you, I, I've known Adrian pretty well. In fact, when the whole no ops argument was happening, I actually went down to Los Gatos to to have a a detente, if you will, uh, you know. Um, but um, you know, and it, it was both sides and why they they saw they had to do no ops, which is a different story. But we had him on the podcast. I know about a year ago, year and a half ago, and like I got to ask him on the podcast, how do you get from zero to sixty to uh, Chaos Monkey, <laughs> right? Um, and it was interesting because um, it was just um, he said so. The, so the, the the first thing you know, even beyond Adrian's answer, is like you don't just turn on Chaos Monkey, right? Like you will suffer the dear and excruciating pain. Um, but so Adrian's answer was, yeah, you know what we did. Um, actually, his flippant answer originally was, you know, when you asked Adrian, how'd you do this? All this, you know, really cool stuff in architecture in the cloud. He says, oh, it was really easy, John. He, he's just an awesome guy, right? He's so, uh, you know, he's self, like he doesn't, he doesn't really have an ego at all, right? Um, and he says, oh, it was really easy, John. I just, um, I gave, um, Drift into Failure to the Ops People, which is Sidney Decker's famous book, and he gave Mike Nargart's release it to the developers, right? But um, to the answer of the 060, the Chaos Monkey, he said, um, you know, we wrote up a, 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 like of a guide of like, here's the things that you as a developer should be aware of and should do. And like you should write decoupled code. You should think, you know, at that time we weren't using the word even microservices, but certainly not cloud native, but like decoupled, bounded context. And oh, by the way, we've got this thing that we have built, which does is built on Mike Nargard's uh, circuit breaker patterns, right? Um, and um, Hysterex, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not, yeah, yeah. And Hysterex, um, an open source project in Netflix put out that builds circuit breaker patterns, right? Uh, and we said, and then the other thing is that um, they gave, you know, developers uh, pagers. In fact, they actually gave the manager and the only person who owned that thing a pager as well, right? Like, so, like, not only developers get woken up at three yep. in the morning, the person who owned the reliability of the service got woken up at three in the morning, right? You want to you want to create change? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get those yeah. people not You keep delivering crap. Night. You're the one that wakes up right. with this now. Yep. But here's the, here's the beauty. They didn't tell anybody, they didn't like say it was a mandate that you must do it this way. They just said, here's the guy, you know, we think you should do this. By the way, here's this little black thing you got to wear every day and, and make sure you, you know, you, you, when it, when it beeps, go ahead and like answer the call. Um, but, and like, it was the, you know, the, again, like I always, uh, I always look for pull models versus push right. models. Right. Um, and, um. And so what happened was the people who didn't take advantage of the structure of the um, the circuit breaker patterns, the people who didn't decouple their code, right? Those are the ones that spent four or five hours every night. And when they'd come in and they, you know, and I'm just paraphrasing and building a, 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 a podcast narrative, but like the uh, they would be like at the coffee machine with red eyes and all and the other guys would be like how'd you sleep like oh i slept like a baby oh how'd you you know he was, oh, no, yeah, i used i followed the guideline in that book you know and um and it just emerged to be that way right this, this, so the beauty story is there when you don't get to zero to 60 to chaos engineering without some deep thought about how you're going to architect your infrastructure, how to how to give the opportunity to create uh, cascading failure, to mitigate cascading failures. and But third and most importantly, you can't mandate and go around with a bully pulpit or a stick or a bat to get everybody to do it. You have to create an environment where people want to do it for their own self-interest. Um, yes, yeah, so that that's how you get to chaos engineering. So, John, I have um, you, you had mentioned your your book earlier, and um, I had some um, some some friends that uh, pinged me with some questions before this, and one of them that I want to get in here is from a colleague named uh, Matt Kuritz, and he's asking. You guys had four authors, if uh, if if I'm cur if I'm remembering correctly. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. So, pair programming was one of the XP uh, practices that turned into mob. Pro How the hell do you mob? write a book mm. with uh, three other strongly opinionated folks um it um it was um very emergent all right so history gene was i met gene when he was about five years into the phoenix project um give or take a year it's probably maybe five or six i'm not really sure right 
And um, and actually, Gene tells his story, right? So I met him. He, we were on a panel together at the DevOps Days. And then um, we were both going to be at South by Southwest. So we agreed to uh, have lunch. And, and that's when I really got to know him. And, um, and we, had, we, we spent like two hours just hanging out. And, and at the time, he wasn't really convinced that DevOps was a thing. Like, um, he was looking at it with skepticism, you know, he, he was trying to position this lifelong dream, or at least a 10-year dream, of creating this story of a rewrite of Elliot Gorat's The Goal, right? When, for those of you who haven't read The Phoenix Project, it's based um, purposely on the original book, The Goal. The difference is, instead of enclaves and automated robots, it was about software stacks and yeah. Java programmers, right? And um, and so we had this long discussion. He was kind of, you know, I guess he felt safe enough to to say, hey, you know, I'm not. Can you convince me that this DevOps thing is real? And I said, well, Gene, look at it this way: operations people have been lost at sea for many years. Uh, I used to joke that we were like cicadas. Every 17 years, the world got so screwed up that we woke up and became heroes and went back to sleep, right? But um, but I said that like, but DevOps is like this light that is like the lighthouse that is bringing us all back. And just that alone is enough to take it serious. And I, he says that pretty much was the, excuse the, the, the corny pun here, but that was the light bulb that actually went off. And, um, and then we started working closely. He actually originally started working with Patrick, Patrick DeBar, uh, of just scoping out, because for, for those who don't know, The Phoenix Project, which you certainly read, is a novel. Gilly Gorat believed that novels were a more effective way to teach people than just manuals or, or how-to books. And, um, and the question came up really early for Gene and anybody who was getting early glimpses of what he was doing was, this novel is going to be great, but everybody's going to want some prescription at the end of it. And so, I mean, as early as 2000, maybe eight or seven, I can't remember, or maybe 10, I'm not sure. Um, we started having these discussions about what would be a companion book to the um, Phoenix Project. And originally, um, Patrick and him started working long hours together, and I muscled my way into that one. I'm like, hey, I'm in. Like, It's not like I want in, I'm in, right? <laughs> and we literally, I mean, for almost a year, worked on um, once a week for about four hours just mapping, we did mind maps that were incredible. In fact, I still have some of those. Somebody's got to get Gene to let us uh, release some of that stuff. But uh, and then actually, we brought in. Uh, I forget who it was. Uh, it was a guy who won. And I, this is what memory's getting bad. But um, he had he wrote he wrote Lean IT, um, and he run the won the Shingo Award. So he was actually going to be one of the original authors too. So it was four of us originally: um, it, uh, Patrick, me, and Gene, and. Uh, and uh, this, um, oh my God, it, the Lean IT book author. Um, but then, um, and we would build these mind maps of Lean, and he would actually teach us a lot about Lean, and Gene would go over TOC, Theory of Constraints, and me and Patrick would try to put in how we thought flow looked like, and diagramming, and, and we actually, um, I'm pretty certain we codified the three ways of DevOps, even during those exercises that Gene eventually put in the Phoenix Project. Um, for this thing that we were going to call the DevOps cookbook. And then, um, then early on, um, Gene, I had introduced Gene to Jez. Now they would have met without me, but we were at an event and Gene said, could you introduce me to Jez? And I had known Jez from some DevOps days. And then Jez came in like, you know, like just as Jez does a storm, right? He was, he added like incredible information. And I will tell you that we probably rewrote that book three or four times over a five year period. Um, and, and, uh, so, um, we, we do like false starts. Um, at one point, we had a, a copy that had a ton of stuff in it. I think Gene sent it out to like 100 people, and we got really bad reviews. Again, I don't think anybody's ever said about this publicly, so don't tell anybody if you hear this. <laughs> Are um, you kidding and then, me? Uh, and then we – well, here's the thing, right? Like this is why the like I believe in complexity and emergence and like all the things that happen for the right reason usually happen for the right reason, right? Even the bad things. Um like most of that book was written in the year. And so we published it about a year ago. Um, it was in like final edit for like six months. So a year prior to that um, is where a lot of came from. And the truth was the DevOps Enterprise Summit started in 14. And that's where all the juicy stuff started right. showing up. So it was really from 14 to, um, you know, near the end, you know, middle of 16 that like most of the stuff in the book 
you know, if I go back again, my memory is like, I, my wife is like, which part did you write? I'm like, yeah, I think a little is, but I'm not sure. And then there was a bunch of stuff, bunch of stuff that got deleted. And so it wasn't very methodical. And at the end of the day, Gene is just a workhorse. I mean, he took everybody's stuff. So it wasn't like a mob type thing. There was no like real clever collaboration. The only time we got real clever was when we were really trying to finalize the book. Then we worked really hard together. Um, you know, we're, you know, taking um, edits and review edits and checking other people's edits. And, and I, I spent a ridiculous amount of time uh, validating every link we had because we had like tons of right. references and, and like a lot of them were wrong or they pointed to the wrong presentation. So I would go watch the pre- – it was, it was brilliant for me because I learned so hmm. much more just editing that book because I – for the last um, – I think actually um, during Christmas – that like whole break there, I literally was watching like about forty or fifty uh, DevOps Enterprise videos that I had not either seen or uh, or QCon presentations. Uh-huh. But anyway, so long answer is um, it wasn't very methodical. I in fact the joke is do as we say, not as we do, because it took us five years to write the book. Uh-huh. Right? <laughs> we tell you to go fast and be you know. So yeah, yeah but in but, the end, but dude, it, it I mean, this be is great this is so. I'll put it in the show notes. I'm not going to go through the whole story, but I actually literally, the day I met John face to face, I pushed people out of the way, literally pushed people out of the way to sit next to him. He said he had one book that he brought with him, but because of what I said, he gave it to me. My boss comes in five minutes late to the meeting. I'm like, sorry, man. <laughs> yeah, that was pretty embarrassing. I, I'm trying to get consulting work with your company, and you just oh, said no, that. Brian I'm like, oh, and sorry, I have I a guess. wonderful relationship. He no. laughs about but Brian that. comes in. He's like, he's like, where's no, my book? And I'm like, we oh, got crap. him the book later. Oh. But, so, but, but it's like, so I look at uh, Gene's. Um, um, Phoenix Project is kind of like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance, right? Yeah. Oh my God. It's a story, yeah. I right? Love that, yeah. But 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 then there's the the Dalai Lama, how to practice the way to a meaningful life. That's yep. that's the DevOps handbook to the Phoenix Project, and, and people have got to. No. I mean, so the DevOps handbook no. just came out on audiobooks. Yeah, yeah, and that's cool. Hey, that was the goal. That was the the goal of that book. Again, there was no uh, uh, intended pun there. Um, The goal of that book was it was very clear when Gene was only about halfway done with the Phoenix Project that that there was going to have to be some kind of prescriptive um, answer to we needed it. Yeah, and yeah, and it like again the timing. Um, the, the, the thing that the DevOps Enterprise Summit with all those case studies, all those people showing up with amazing – I mean, I'll tell a little – another anecdote story. I love that um, um, I think around 2000, probably 2014, um, up until 2014, there would be this um, constant Twitter debate between people who work for the big consulting companies and a lot of just people who are very passionate about DevOps. And the big consultants would, would like pat us on the head like, yeah, you young guys are – and I'm like, hey, I'm not a young guy. I started in Exxon. But OK, let's – you know, we can get past that. They'd be like, you gun guys don't know what it's like in an enterprise. And like, you know, you're just not going to be able to do DevOps this, the way you guys talk about in the enterprise. And we would say, bo, right. bo, bo, bo. And Damon, Damon would argue. And I'd be like, you know what, Damon? Don't even bother. Like, we know it's true. And then I knew – when we when we did the first CFP for the 2014 DevOps Enterprise Summit, I was like, you know what? I told Damon and I told Gene, like, we're going to prove our point. And then we got 200 submissions and 100 of them were vendors, but 100 of them were like hardcore enterprise, non-compromising on culture stories. None of them were like, we hit the button and it, it was awesome and we won. But they were like failures and like, let me tell you how hard it was. In fact, I love the Target story. The Target originally was Heather Mickman from development and Ross Clanton from operations gave a co-presentation together about dev and ops. And they had talked about at one point, they had to stop calling it DevOps. It had taken on a bad connotation in Target. So they literally put a moratorium on the name, but kept the practices going, right? Mm-hmm. And um, and so um, you know, just those stories and watching the enterprise, and then be able to go back and say, you know what, you know, let's not argue on Twitter. Come to DevOps Enterprise Summit, and then let me hear your answer. 
you know, and then we saw the same thing in 2015. And, you know, there's 400, there's well over 400 videos of companies out there over the last four years that, um, that are just case studies. So we put 48 of them. Actually, I think about uh, 15 of them were web scale stories, but, but at least 30 of them are large enterprise, non-compromising on the core DevOps principles, um, and moving towards success stories, right? Because A, it's never done to, it, you know, I used to get really mad when people would tell me, you know, like you don't really know the enterprise. I'm like, dude, I, I implemented Tivoli at JP Morgan Chase. There was 17 business units. They have well over 10,000 value streams. Don't tell me I don't know what the enterprise looks like. Hey, John, man, you know I could keep talking to you for hours and, and, and we're, we got, I'm lucky to be in the same at least 45 minutes city from you. So, so we're going to have time back tomorrow. <laughs> so, yeah, um, totally. but uh, I want to be mindful of your time as well as, you know, we keep our podcast down about 45 minutes. So what I want to do is give you a chance to, to give people, we've, we've already talked about DevOps Enterprise Summit coming up in November. What else would you like to tell our listeners about what you got going on soon and how can they find out more about you and what you're up to? I mean, you know, the, I would say my kind of nexus to, um, to everything starts with my Twitter account. If you guys could post, cause it's a terrible name, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a heartful name. I love it, but it was bad. It was a bad marketing decision to choose that, but I did choose it when Twitter first started. Oh, so, wow. uh, but um, B O T C H A G A L U P E. So um, you know, from there, I do actually have. Um, I put all my presentations on um, a GitHub project. The uh, my account is Botchagloop as well. So I'm basically Botchagloop yeah. everywhere. Botchagloop at Gmail. Botchagloop uh, there, um, and then um, as well as um, my, I have a, a account on GitHub, and I have a. Um, uh, a project called My Presentations, which really just has a link to just about everything I've done in the last six years, including some just silly stuff where I've played music at DevOps Days events and that kind of stuff. So it'll tell you everything I know. I'm currently working for uh, SJ Technologies, um, a woman-owned, minority-owned, um, doing some work in the public sector, which has been um, really fun. Um, you know, I, I walk into these kind of uh, large-scale um public sector um, organizations, you know, government, and I say, you know, hey, I've never worked in the public sector, but I'm naive enough to think I can help, right? And and um, and I think that the timing is really fun there because I think there's a lot of, in certain parts of the public sector organizations, there's, um, there's this sense that we need to do something different. And so the timing seems so far to be a lot of fun to collaborate with uh, some of these agencies. Um, that um that are really just trying to do try something different awesome ryan you take a turn here uh how can our listeners get in touch with you what do you got going on yeah so um i'm at agile phl on twitter you can find me on the agile uprising coalition um coming up actually we're releasing this next week so new york people i will be speaking at the app dynamics conference uh summit in the uh, the lower east side, it's a uh, next Thursday. It's the Thursday of the release of the show. Completely free. Come check it out. Um, it's they call it a silent disco format. So a bunch of people standing in an open space with headphones on, listening to whichever speaker they want to listen to. I'm completely freaked out. I'll probably lock up on stage or, or start cursing, which is what happens when I get anxious. <laughs> so um, yeah, come come watch me crash and burn. That'd be cool. Yeah. Um, I got a couple other things on RyanLocker.com in the event section. There's a, I kind of came out of my shell a little bit again. Uh, I got a bunch of speaking engagements coming up. Um, got a big one that I'm not allowed to talk about yet, so that'll be that'll be released soon. Um, other than that, yeah, just keep keep liking the show, keep uh, retweeting the show uh, to the guy that makes those Twitter images where you, you put the quotes out there for us every single episode. Keep doing that, brother. We really appreciate it. Awesome. And then for me, uh, I'm presently in a battle uh, uh, that's been going on for over a decade with the guy who owns PaulElia.com. Uh, not, not, not in a bad way. He's over on the other side of the pond, but he's had that damn domain name for over 15 years. It, it expires 
on uh, Sunday and I'm hoping to snipe it this time. I'm always hoping every year to snipe it. In the meantime, paulelia.net. Um, I will be at the DevOps Enterprise Summit. Man, I would love to talk to anybody that would, you know, is, is juicy into this as we are. Um, and uh, right now I'm just kicking it at uh, a little bank called SunTrust. It's a small enough boat to turn around and big enough to matter and having a great time. So that's awesome. Um, so yeah, great. Uh, John, thanks again, man. This is so awesome. Thanks to our listening audience. If you enjoyed the podcast, please give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or the podcast platform of your choice. If this is your first time tuning in, why don't you subscribe to our podcast? And uh, if you'd like to discuss Agile, DevOps, Lean, all these kinds of stuff, come on over to uh, AgileUprising.com. Join the coalition. It's free. And uh, we have a good time there. 